Hi guys, it's Professor Troy talking to you today about lift. It's not a drag, it's a lift. If you laugh at that, you get an instant A in the course. Um, so a lot of cool applications for the lift force. You have a hang glider or an airplane, you know, really anything that's flying. It could be a bird. Um, obviously, lift plays a key role in keeping the hang glider in flight. Um, another example of a flying object is over here, the kite, right? So the kite is relying on a lift force to keep it up in the air. It's uh, the lift force is working against the weight of the kite and the tension in the string. Um, if you like sports, table tennis or ping pong, um, there is a ton of lift in table tennis, you know, related to, well, I don't want to give away one of the key mechanisms for lift, but there's a lot of lift in table tennis and hopefully that'll be clear by the end of the lecture. Um, and then more of an engineered situation here with the submarine, the way that you get the submarine to move up and down or steer left or right, up or down, can be with the um, tail planes that you see back here. And these tail planes are essentially generating lift, uh, a lift force. Uh, and so let's learn about the lift force clearly, right? All right. Here we have flow around an object and you see the flow separating behind the object. And as a result of that, we have high pressure on the upstream side and low pressure on the downstream side. This color is pressure here. So the net force is going to be as shown here. And we break that force into a component of drag along the flow direction and lift perpendicular to flow. So that's really the distinguishing feature between drag and lift. Drag is always going to be in the direction of flow and lift by definition is perpendicular to the flow. Lift is not always in the upwards direction vertically. Okay, so it can be down or up, it can be left or right, but the key is that it's perpendicular to the flow direction. So when do you get the lift force? Well, you get the lift force when you have an asymmetry in the pressure distribution. Okay, so in this case, we need to have somehow a higher pressure on the bottom side of the object than on the top side of the object in order to have a force that will be perpendicular to the flow direction, okay? Okay, so there's a couple of different types of objects that would experience lift. So the first class of objects that would experience lift is like the one we saw before. Objects that are asymmetric with respect to the flow direction are going to have a higher pressure on one side than the other, which is gonna in turn cause a lift force, right? So all of these um, objects here are asymmetric with respect to the flow uh, axis, if you will, right? And they would lead to a, some sort of a force in the perpendicular direction. It might be towards the top, it might be towards the bottom as we're looking at them here, okay? What might surprise you is that even objects that are fully symmetric with respect to the flow direction can experience lift, okay? So a square oriented this way, an ellipse, a circle, or a triangle, all of these objects are symmetric with respect to the flow direction, and yet, there are ways in which those objects can also experience lift, okay? And so that requires some sort of an asymmetric flow field around the objects, okay? So let's start by looking at the asymmetric objects first, and then we'll look at the symmetric objects in a second. Okay, this is what you call an asymmetric airfoil. It could be the wing of an airplane. So an airfoil is designed to generate high pressure on the... Uh, underside of the wing and low pressure on the top side. That will occur because the flow on the top of the wing seen here is moving faster than the bottom. And according to the Bernoulli theorem, uh, faster flow has lower pressure. Okay, and you can see that by the streak lines that are going over the object there. Okay, so an asymmetric airfoil. Okay, the next object you see here is a, could be a buried pipeline or half of a pipeline. And what tends to happen is that you have the flow accelerating over the top of the, of the pipe, and you can actually get a low pressure in that region due to the flow velocity being high there. And that can lead to a lift force that can literally suck this thing off the ground. Okay, the next one that's cool, especially for those of you that are structural engineers, is the flow around a house. And there are actually um, building codes designed to deal with situations like this, wind loading that's causing not only a drag force, but a lift force. It can literally suck the roof off the house in a very, very strong wind, okay? So uh, something to consider if you're a structural engineer. And there is a code, uh, an ASCE code, that covers wind loading on buildings. So it's a really, really interesting topic and pretty well developed. 
This is a slightly different aspect ratio roof, and you see that the, the flow field is different, as it will be around any building. You could have a low pressure region on the top, and then if you actually have a hole in the building, like a window or an open door, um, that may allow some of the flow to get in, and then you might actually end up uh, pressurizing the inside of the house, in which case that would only add to the lift force that would be potentially trying to have the roof uh, go off the house. Okay, so those were all examples of asymmetric objects like the house, the asymmetric airfoil. Now let's look at how you can get a lift force on a symmetric object. And there's really two cases, okay? So one case is if you take this symmetric object and angle it, okay? So maybe that's cheating, but um, if you angle this object, you can create a lift force. So um, there, are, I'll show you a picture of a symmetric airfoil that you angle, and that is uh, one possibility. And any of these objects, aside from the, the sphere here, you couldn't angle that. That wouldn't really change anything. But the triangle, the, the rectangle, and the ellipse would all lead to an asymmetry in the pressure distribution in the transverse direction. The second way that you can generate lift on a symmetric object is to have the object spinning, okay? And you know, there, you may think, oh, there's not so many, when is this triangle going to be spinning or this rectangle? And maybe not, but um, there are many instances where spheres or cylinders are spinning, right? So sports is a great example where you have balls, you know, with backspin, topspin, side spin. I think that's all the kinds of spin there is, um, leading to lift. And that's what makes curve balls curve. And that's what makes, you know, sinkers sink and risers rise. I don't think there's a riser, but um, you get the idea. Okay, so let's look at the flow around um, first some angled objects and then I'll just sketch the flow for the rotating objects. Okay. Okay, this is a symmetric airfoil. It is symmetric. Um, you are, it's actually angled upward, which would cause a downward lift. You have low pressure on the bottom and high pressure on the top. So there is such a thing as downward lift. Maybe the airplane is descending. Okay. Okay, so let's look at what we call the Magnus effect, which is where the object is spinning to create an asymmetric flow field around the object, okay? And the most common scenario for a spinning object is sports, right? Where you have a ball that is rotating and spinning. So for this example, I'm going to have a, a ping pong ball that's spinning in the counterclockwise direction. The flow, if you will, is going from left to right. And what that could be analogous to or identical to is if the ball was actually moving from right to left through stationary fluid and had the spin of topspin in this case, okay? Um, and so that's how we'll, we'll think about it, okay? So um, what does the spinning actually do to the flow field? Well, the way to think about that is that on the, the no-slip condition is key, right? So the fluid stuck to the ping pong ball has the velocity of the ping pong ball, which everywhere along the, out, the edge of the ping pong ball is going to be in the direction of rotation, okay? So that's our first ingredient, okay? So the second ingredient is that on the top of the ball, you have the velocity going in the direction opposing flow, and in the bottom of the ball, you have the direction of spinning going in the direction of flow, which means that the velocity of the flow is accentuated at the bottom and retarded at the top, okay? So you have a slower velocity at the top than you do at the bottom. In both cases, the flow is going around the, the ball. It doesn't actually turn around unless this thing was crate spinning a ton. Um, but what that means is that you get a flow field that looks something like this. So let me just draw in the streamlines there, okay? So um, on the bottom of the object, you are going to have a convergence of the streamlines because the flow is going to be faster there, okay? So you have fast flow near the bottom of the object and you're going to have slow flow near the top of the object because the direction of flow is uh, in opposition to the direction of the uh, spinning of the ball at that location, okay? So what that leads to is a pressure asymmetry, right? So we know from Bernoulli that fast flow causes low pressure, right? So we would have a low pressure on the bottom of the object 
and a high pressure on the top of the object, and all of that will equate, in this scenario as I've sketched it here, to a downward lift force, okay? So again, lift doesn't always have to be up. Lift just means perpendicular to the flow. And so in this case, you have a, a, a lift force in the downward direction, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the exact, this is what you would see if this ball was traveling from right to left into stationary fluid and had this spin. This spin is called top spin, and it makes the ball dip. You have that in tennis, you have it in volleyball, uh, soccer, all sorts of sports, okay? If we were looking at this ball from the top, then this would be more of a side spin, right? And this would actually cause the ball to curve uh, in one direction or the other, left or right, depending on what you were calling left or right, okay? Um, and all of these ideas are lift because they are forces that are perpendicular to the direction of flow, okay? Um, and so that is the Magnus effect. Now, how do we quantify lift? Okay, well, we quantify lift the same way that we quantify drag, which generally speaking is by doing experiments where the lift force is measured and then you uh, figure out the relationship between the lift force and the other parameters of the problem. And so for the flow, uh, you have parameters like the velocity, the density, and the viscosity. We have the lift force that we are um, measuring either with uh, experiments or computer simulations. And then we look to express that lift force as a function of things like the Reynolds number um, and you know the geometry of the object, et cetera. And in the, in the former case of the Magnus effect, um, perhaps the rotation rate. And that would be a non-dimensional rotation rate, okay? Um, so the lift coefficient is, is defined in the same way that we define the drag coefficient. It is equal to the lift force divided by one half, um, oops, sorry there, one half rho v squared times a reference area. And I will give you a bit of caution yet again about the reference area. The reference area for the lift coefficient is even less likely to be the area that the flow sees with the exception of the, of the ball. It is actually the circular area in this case. Um, but for something like an airfoil, it is not the, air, the area that the flow sees. It's the plan view area of the airfoil. So as long as you pay attention to how the reference area is defined in the chart, and apply that definition, you will be correct in terms of getting your lift force out of a lift coefficient. And you're gonna look for charts that show you how the lift coefficient either varies with the Reynolds number, the geometry, um, geometric, geometry, um, or the rotation rate, uh, and you're gonna get that lift coefficient and simply apply the definition of the, of the lift coefficient to obtain the lift force, okay? And the last part of the problem may be doing something like this, you know, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And again, you just want to keep in mind that the lift force you get from the lift coefficient is the component of the flow force in the direction perpendicular to flow. Okay? Okay, that's it for the lift force. The next videos on lift will be applications and teach you how to do the nuts and bolts but I hope you feel as uplifted as I do. Whoa!